vlog entry day four, but day five of the trip. We had a lovely time in Memphis. Uh, we spent time on the Mississippi River and time with family, and it was wonderful eating ribs and pulled pork. Uh, today we're leaving Wichita, Kansas, Kansas, with its huge skies, the Great Plains, and everything is new and sprawling. But I would never live here because they don't have postcards. They're just not well known enough to have postcards, so no one wants to send their love. Couldn't live here. Uh, Lexington, Kansas was brand new too, or Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. They didn't have postcards either. Couldn't live there either. But today we're on our way to Denver, Colorado. I'm sure they'll have postcards there. And um, we left off somewhere around the 20th year when Grandpa had been in his cadets, so we're gonna pick right back up there. Hi. Hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning from just north of Wichita, Kansas. And a beautiful, beautiful sky, just like you said, it spreads out forever. And uh, it's very enjoyable. Yesterday, it, it, we were coming out of Memphis. We went through this one storm front. Luckily, we just, we, we drove, uh, actually Rachel was driving at the time. We drove through a storm front that produced a total of 38 tornadoes yesterday morning and yesterday. But we, we were lucky, we just got some strong winds. Well, we're starting now back, uh, actually in the, the second part of the second 20 years now. And, We'd gone along, I'd graduated aviation cadets and got stationed in Mobile. We talked about that before in the first night. Uh, and then uh, uh, your grandmother Ann and I, I got back together again. And we were to be married in, in December. Where did you get married? We got married at the Episcopal Church. Uh, in fact, where all the girls were married. We got married at the Episcopal Church in uh, Past Christian, Mississippi. And was everyone there? And everyone was there, including an honor guard of my, made up of my buddies who found all the pieces of the dress uniform and had swords and everything else. And they stood outside the, the chapel for us and when the ceremony was over. And it was, it was a really, it was a, it was a good time. It, you know, as second lieutenant, you, you don't have much money. You just have a bunch of dreams and things. And I guess one of our first dreams was when Kathy came along, who was a, a gangly young lady cried quite a bit as, as a baby, Not, uh, <laughs> just because it was new to me, it was new to your, to your grandmother, and, uh, and the whole thing. But Kathy was my toy. I used to, uh, as well as all the girls were, I, I used to toss her in the air and everything. My grandmother just about had fit. Uh, uh, grandmother Lucy about had fit because I, because I did treat Kathy <laughs> like a little toy. It bounced her in the air and everything else. Kathy had this thing where she could suck on a, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, on a nipple and still take food from the other side of the house. <laughs> <laughs> she and she did one thing, was probably a, a signatory thing for Kathy, and that uh, long about six months, we had some six months check, take it down to the uh, pediatrician. He's going to have these, he has this coat on, tie, and he has French cuffs. Uh, and he goes like this and he spreads Kathy's legs apart just as he did. <laughs> Kathy Pete went right up his French cup. I mean, it's straight. <laughs> you ought to see him turn every color in the book, trying to shake his arm like that with a white cup. <laughs> but that's Kathy, he's always full of surprises. <laughs> well, then as Kathy started going, and then. Uh, Get in the back, Kayla. 364 days later, or 365 days later, Diane was born. By this time, Get back. we'd moved up to Charleston, South Carolina. I had actually gone to a party that night, and, and uh, your grandmother Ann called me and said it was time. So uh, I uh, rapidly unpartied myself, went and picked her up, took her to the hospital. And Diane was born, I think, an hour, hour and a half later. So now we had two young ladies, and uh, cute as a button. One more thing that uh, your mom had done was, I think by this time, let's see, Kathy was three and Diane was two, and Sandy was born in about cold February morning. And, and uh, 
forgot the year right now, but they, they, but but so I took I took Kathy and Sandy out to the officers' club, sat them down. They were very I had them all looking very pretty in their nice dresses, and uh, the, the, it's typical. It was an officers' club, very staid, sedate at the time. All of a sudden, Kathy stands up and says, "Daddy, Diane has to go to the bathroom, or she has to go pee." <laughs> And Diane looks up at it like, I do? <laughs> Kayla, get every, in the back. Get in the back. In get the in back. back. In the back. Get in the back. Good girl. And of course, everybody, because they're on a club, just look over like I'm, I'm mistreating my girls, you know. Uh, then it was a, they were pull another surprise while, while Ann's still in the hospital with Sandy. They, uh, at that time, they had a liquid aspirin, and uh, those being childproof because it had a, it had a button inside the bottle that you could turn it upside down, and it wouldn't spill out. And of course, you could try to suck on it, and you couldn't suck anything up. Well, the girls foxed it. They found a straw, and they drank the whole bottle of liquid aspirin. They split it between themselves. And Kathy shakes me on. Thank God, she shook me on. I said, "Daddy, look, empty bottle." And sure enough, I said, oh, God, rushed him out to the base hospital. And they gave him syrup of Ipecac. Ipecac. Ipecac, yeah. And of course, they threw all over, threw up all over the hospital. And and after a while, they determined, you know, checking pulse rate and everything else, that the aspirin didn't do any harm. And all and, and they got all the aspirin out. They'd thrown it up. Well, and they're, they're, they're ready to go home now. So that's a winter day in February in Charleston. Cold, wintry, blustery, wet. Driving back home. And of course, I had them out. Now, all the windows are closed because it's cold. And between the two of them, they threw up enough against the windshield, against all the windows. <laughs> I was lucky to be. I had to wipe down the windshield just to see how I could get home. And uh, so that was another experience uh, brought on by your sister and your aunt. <laughs> well, then we go and then, and then say, now we got the three girls. And, and, uh, of course, as girls will, I guess, with their father, they make you feel like a king as they get anything they want. And, uh, and of course, with the three of them, uh, Sandy always thought they got what, her older sister got what they wanted because they were older, and they always thought she was the baby of the family, so she got everything, including all the attention. So this was to go through all the way through. It was a, it's a very delightful time. We went. Where we, were you living when Mom was born? We, uh, we were living in Mobile, Alabama at the time, and uh, and then just before, and then of course, when your mom was born, it was only a year later until Diane was born, and in that interim period, we had moved up to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and at first we lived out on a, out towards the ocean, I've forgotten even the whole name of the area now. Uh, but it was okay, but then we found a nice place uh, um, up behind Charleston, uh, something, not Sumter, but uh, I forgot the name of it too, but north and, and west, a little bit north, but primarily west of Charleston, South Carolina. We found another place that was real pretty, and it was next to a huge oak, it was next to the uh, Episcopal Church in this little town, in a huge oak tree. And then we lived there until, um, uh, until a hurricane came through Charles and knocked over that oak tree and it went right across the house we were living in. Oh. And it was and it really smushed. Luckily we were there, but luckily no no one was hurt. Uh, luckily the car it caved in the garage, but the car came out unscathed out of the garage. And of course, as soon as the storm passed, the the, the rector or whoever the, the the chief domo at the Episcopal Church there, and run they don't worry, the church will take care of everything. That's the way the thing goes. He comes back and then we said, okay, well, no worry, we have no worries, you know, you know, that'll help us move. And this time we moved down back to Lenore, I'll tell him about that in a second. But he, when he comes back tonight, he says, well, you know, yesterday, he said, please excuse me for misspeaking, so to speak, but uh, we can't take care of, uh, we can't help you out. You can't? Why? Well, we found a lawyer said it was an act of God. Oh. And we're not responsible. I said, well, it couldn't have come from a better place from the Episcopal Church, you know, to our house. 
Uh, sure, I guess. So anyway, we moved there and then we bought a house in Linovar, which is Ravenel spelled back, but Ravenel is a big politician in town and scooped up all the property and now we bought one of his houses, actually a brand new subdivision. If you can imagine a three bedroom house, two bath, and you know, fair and uh, fair bedroom, not not huge, but fair, fair size bedroom. Eighteen thousand five hundred dollars new. Wow. And uh, and your grandmother Ann was a little bit reluctant because she had never lived in a new house before. Well, neither did I. But, uh, and she didn't know if she deserved living in a new house. That was all the thing that, as I said before, sort of the back of her mind, you know, that, uh, that she wasn't fit in the mold. She was, she did real well, but, but uh, there was this thing in it. Anyway, uh, so we're, we're in Lenovar now uh, with, with all three girls. At this time, I'm approaching five years uh, in the Air Force, and it's all flying transports. I've got over 5,000. I'm averaging over 1,000 hours a year. And uh, one of the higher numbers within the squadron. And flying all, which I, I enjoy, but when you look back at it... Uh, hey. Hey. Kayla. 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 When you look back at it, you say, good God, you crossed the ocean that chunk? That's what, a prop air, propeller airplane. So you did that for five years? You... I did that for five years. At first, I was flying C-54s and, and, and mobile. The C-54 is the old DC-4. And then I transferred over to the C-124, which is at that time the world's largest airplane. And, and then we moved that squadron. That squadron moved to Charleston. That's why we went to Charleston for mobile. And... Uh, so now it's flying C-124s uh, the rest of the time. Probably a total of six years altogether. And, uh, and then from there I said, well, it's time to get out of this. So I, I go and ask my personnel guy in the squad and say, hey, you know, it's time for me to back off from flying so much full time. What schools are available? He goes through a list. He says, here's one. He said, they're crying for applicants. It's t on the technical side, it's communications. I said, well, why not? You know, I, I, I had done the technical part in the Navy when I was working with computers and, and guns. So, so then, um, uh, uh, so I picked that, and about four or five, six months later, I got to school. Uh, then went down, we went down to Keesland, and it had first. I don't know if we lived in Pasture again, I commuted, or did we, uh, we lived on base, but I think we lived on base. Uh, in fact, I'm sure we lived on base, and there in Keystone, because there's, there's where uh, another one from your mom, your mom and the girls, uh, at, uh, must have been Kathy's, I think I told you about my fifth birthday when I took the, we took the movies, and there there's Kathy, she's directing. <laughs> she has all the little kids at, at the birthday party lined up. This is where they're supposed to do things. They do it on her command. <laughs> and I just said, so Diane looks at her and you know, why? <laughs> Sandy, look at the baby and said, oh, who cares? <laughs> no, that, that's the way. And it was, but very enjoyable. We had a good time. We had bought a boat down there. We had a, a I don't know how I did that. Uh, <laughs> at that time, I wasn't. Wasn't so afraid to stretch out and debt and things, and uh, so I bought a boat. Had a good time with that on Back Bay and everything. Motorboat? Yeah, it was a motorboat, 21 foot, and had a 75 horsepower Johnson. And Three we minutes. Had gotten, a, had gotten a really good deal. Then we sold it just just before we left, and the guy got a good deal. We bought it. Um, then we from and then from okay, so then. Uh, the girls went back with their mom to Pass Christian. Then we rented a place in Pass Christian. How did that go? And how old were you at this time? Well, uh, when I go to the Philippines, it was 1963, so I was 30 years old. 63. When you moved to yeah. Pass Christian? Just, just at 30, right? Just turned 30. And yeah, I was a captain this time. I felt a brand new captain. And uh, there, and, and now once you have to correct me if you've heard this story before. 
Okay, wait. Uh, how long is this story? Because we have three minutes. Should I switch okay, well, tapes? Very quickly, someone okay. uh, shows someone looking out on, on, on my shoulder, giving some guidance. When I first got there into the squadron, uh, they made me chief of maintenance, and they bumped me over. A whole bunch of people knew what they do, were doing. And to me, this is I was brand new into this area of radar. And now they make me chief of maintenance. I have radar units and people, comm and radar units, spread out all the Southeast Asia. The war is getting going real well. What it's, war? This was the Vietnam War. Okay. In 63. I happened to be in Vietnam 63, 4, 5, 6, and 7. But in 63, I gone into this, into this uh, uh, communication radar outfit. I had about, I don't know, 300 maintenance people working for me all over. The morale was real bad. Why? Because the effectiveness reports were real bad. So I got the senior NCOs and said, hey gang, what's happening? I will not give you an effectiveness report any higher than the average effectiveness report that you give on your own people. All you, you permit your lower rank and sergeants to write on other people. Within six months, the effectiveness reports are turned around, they were getting glowing reports. The people themselves were glowing because they had glowing reports and they started getting promoting, which they didn't do before. I had probably the best morale outfit in the, over there in wow. the Philippines. And it was because someone told me to, hey, treat the gang like human beings, you know, and tell them you really like them and they'll work hard. And they did. And, and the sergeants were amazed what they could do by just getting their writing skills honed a little bit. Oh. And uh, so that's how we how we progress there in the Philippines. There are a lot more we'll talk about. Yeah. When, All right, well, I'm going to switch the tape. OK. okay. So how long had you lived in Pass Christian for before you moved to the Philippines? Well, I, I had not lived in Pass Christian at site when I was at Kiso Air Force Base. And then we had, uh, when I went to the Philippines, I had, I had to go by myself until we could find a house and get permission for Ann and the girls to come over. So how long were you there and I, I, was by, I was by myself in the Philippines for until from March until June. Okay. And so uh, Ann and the girls weren't there that long, but they, they came over in, in June by themselves with, with Ann, and, and uh, they flew across a commercial, but it was a chartered commercial jet, and in the Philippines and a lot of things, and this is where Sandy, now in the Philippines, we lived off base in a town called Angeli. That town was late, and next to this mountain, Mount Araya, that later uh, blew up, and this is what oh. covered, that covered uh, the whole base and ash. Were you there at that time? No, we had, we'd already gone. That's good. And uh, the town of Angeli was, was buried, but that's where the girls spent uh, probably uh, uh, over a year. Uh, uh, Dan had a huge size one of the compound that we lived in, and a whole bunch of other things happened. Some little vignettes were, um, uh, that's where San, you know, we, we took, they said, don't drink the local water, always in the So we had these five gallon plastic water jars. One day, fill up the plastic water jar, several of them at a time, and then bring them back to the house. That's what we, that's what we drank and everything else. Well, we took the spigot, we took the, 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 the spigot off of the, not didn't take the spigot off, we took the, the handle off the pipe so that, specifically so that Sandy wouldn't uh, drink the water. Because she liked to turn it on, play with it, and drink. Well, she found a, she found that she could work a pair of pliers. Now, she's only like three years old, and three or four, maybe four. But she got a pair of pliers, and she turned the, the faucet on them. We look out. And the wind in there, she's drinking water directly under the tap. Ah, this is that same. Don't touch the water. Yeah, we just knew she was. She had been bit off more than she could chew. Well, more than she could swallow, but it didn't didn't affect her at all. There was one other thing when Sandy was born. And this goes back to Charles. That that really happened was she had a bottle. No, no. Somehow she had a. a, a drop of water and the drop of water itself had, had lied in the throat. I'm looking at her and she's turning color. I call I call for Ann, get her quick. So she grabs her, she gonna run, and she at this time she totally blew it. Oh jeez. We but Ann's gonna run across the street, a lady across the street from us was a nurse. 
but it's about 10 degrees outside, 10, 15 degrees. And then the second, we hit the cold weather. She went to a, a short spat through the drop, and the dark thing later, because we took it to the hospital right away. The dark thing is just a drop of liquid had gotten stuck in her throat, if you can believe it. Maybe we could lay it down, you know. But uh, there was a, that was within seconds, it, it, it would have been too much for her. But they came out, went to the hospital, checked out, and everything was okay. Okay, now back back to the Philippines. Some of the thing with the girls, we had this maid. At that time, a maid, live-in maid, was $10 a month. Oh. And so we had this one, Maria. And uh, she was real nice. And and uh, I, in the, in the, I was flying to Taiwan, and I get a 55 kilo, so 110, say 110. 20 pounds of rice at a time. And it's a big thing, bring it back. Well, Maria would invite all, she said, come my cousin. Well, when, when one cousin comes, all of a sudden we have about six, the maid and five of her cousins living with us, just because we got so much rice. I said, take the rice, okay, but I can't stand this, you know, that's too much for the kids uh, out. And, uh, you know, so Maria did that. Another thing I did, I had this little Buddha that I had up on the dresser, and Maria, a very, she was 18, 18 years old, but a very staunch Catholic. And she couldn't understand me shooting the bull with the Buddha. I'd ask him, you know, how's this flight going to be today? You know, the trip going to be all right? And she would look at me. Well, one morning, I mean, it was there on the dresser at night. And the next morning, when, when we awoke, the Buddha's gone. So I just know that during the night, Maria had come into our bedroom, had gotten that Buddha and tossed them out the backyard into, into the swamp or the woods back there, into the forest as far as she could, that I'd never see the Buddha again. <laughs> oh, goodness. And then, as, as the, and this is why I used to tell the girls stories, in which I'm sure they remember. There was Kathy Dog, Diane Dog, at that time, Dee Dog, and, and Sandy Dog. And I'd, I'd tell stories about where the three dogs went. And they'd say, Dad, tell me the stories. The, the dogs always were into something different all the time. And we would do that. We would lay in bed, the girls and me, and with, with, the, with their mom. Uh, sometimes, so she got tired of listening to the stories. The girls did that. But we'd tell her during every, uh, every uh, uh, typhoon that would come to. And for a while, it seemed like every week we had a typhoon. Luckily, the house stayed together. Well, the concrete house. We had a tin roof, but none of the tin ever came off, but it would flap during the day. Flap, flap, flap. All night long, you'd hear the tin beating up on the top of the roof as the, ty as the typhoon goes through. Uh, it was during a war, and, and, uh, and uh, I was in and out of Vietnam. Uh, well, fairly we kind of, I was flying, I was, I was just flying transports. Mm -hmm. We were flying the generals around, flying cargo around, stuff like that. Uh, we had, uh, so we did that for a little bit over two years, and with, um, as we talked about the other, the other day, uh, we, we had a fourth, a fourth little baby girl who was coming along just about the same time that we're rotating back to the States. Our two years was up, going back to the States, and, uh, and Anne had to be AeroVac back to the States, and the girl and I uh, had gone back uh, by ourselves. Uh, a memorial, a memorable thing that happened on our the girls on our flight back. We'd gone into, the, um, we'd flown into the, from the Philippines into Honolulu, and then they they refueled and everything else. Then we took off at nighttime, flying into San Francisco, and um, and the, and the pilot said, "Okay, everybody, look out the right side." It was pitch black, but he spotted from 900 miles away. He could see a missile shot, uh, which is a Miniman missile heading towards Kwajalein, which is somewhere south of Hawaii. But we all looked out the right side of the window, I'm sure that the other girls remember, and we could also see from 900 miles, and we were up at 40,000 feet, but we could see 900 miles away, we could see the missile launch. Wow. We saw it just, we saw it as a smoke ring came out of the hole, we saw the missile go up, and we watched it, and then it lit up the whole sky. And the, and this gave you something to think about, you know, if there was an actual war where, you know, a thousand of these things were launched, oh, God forbid, you know, wow, it'd, it'd, be, it'd be awesome for the few moments that you lived. And, uh, but we got to see that. We got in there, 
and the pregnancy just wasn't good. And the doctor said, well, she has to be confined in the bed, she, and so we're going to keep her there. So why don't you take the girls, the, uh, and we're talking about the, the girl's grandmother was down at Pastor Pizzo, and we said, why don't you take the girls to New Orleans and come on back. So I, in fact, Lucy was really glad to hear that. Grandma Lucy was really glad to hear that. And that's why, I don't know if I told this part before, we went to the terminal in, in, the, in San Francisco and with uh, uh, with Eastern Airlines and it was, um, it was our airplane was full, full, full and, and then we'll have to wait for the next airplane. But we'll, we'll put you on American Airlines. So we go to American Airlines, which is going to leave like uh, almost right away. So they put us on American Airlines, but they had seats. We go out, lost the brake system, so we were tugged back in. And the guys were nice enough at American. He said, hey, well, we're going to put you on uh, on Eastern. And I'm thinking, well, we just were kicked off Eastern because they didn't have room for us. So he, he calls over, and it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and he calls over to talk to Eastern. He said, oh, you don't. He's asked for seats. Well, oh, you don't. Well, what about first class? Oh, okay, give him first class. Let's do this bad American. <laughs> And sure enough, here we, on the airplane, we were turned down for regular seats. Now we're flying first class. And we didn't really need the first time any of us had flown first class. And we get to, and so the stewardess is coming around and we're sitting down. And so I told the girls, and the stewardess said, Stewart's got a big kick. I said, give them champagne, except give it to me and split my eggs with them. And that was, so that's the way I drank their champagne and they had my eggs. And we just had a good old time going to the yeah, well, then they got with their grandmother, and uh, I was talking with the docs out there, and they said, you better come back up real quick because uh, things aren't going well. So I got on the next airplane, up airplane after I got back, flew back to uh, Los Angeles, or uh, San Francisco, went up to the hospital, and uh, I'm there, and things, uh, we thought it stabilized. Uh, but then, almost like we're watching Sandy, I saw I saw their mom just turn almost comatose, and I, and I yelled, and the doctors came out, and sure enough, she had, uh, uh, whatever was going on inside, had, had stopped all function, and they got her, very quickly, they got her breathing again, and, and uh, you know, probably less than 30 seconds total, maybe until like 20 seconds, and I, as soon as I saw, I watched them when it happened, yelled, they were right in there, gave us a sh uh, shot or whatever, and brought her around. But that started the process of the, the birth started right then. Uh, and, and it was, a, and the baby was still born, had been, had been alive, but was born, was still born. And uh, so the, the, bar the baby was buried out there, but in a children's cemetery, so that, and they do it so that this, there's no name, there, there, if, there, if there are names, it would only be in a group. There's no particular spot within the cemetery where you could, you could recognize. And it had been a little girl? It had been a, a little girl, that's right. So that was in the process of being, well, I was going back to Keesler again for the advanced school, another year in school. And uh, so we went there, we lived on base, for a while, and well, in fact, we lived on banks. Then we uh, went from there. The next assignment was out to Los Angeles. That was that was fun time. It was a very short tour. We went out to Los Angeles, and we and, and because they had they had discount tickets, military discount tickets to go to Disney World, Disneyland, <laughs> Disneyland, Disneyland, the original Disney. We're uh, by almost every week. We're at Disneyland. <laughs> And the girls ate it up. I did too. We would be riding with them, you know. So we always had a we always had a good time there. We saw everything you could possibly see. But then they said, "Hey, you you have got to go back overseas. You got to go back to Southeast Asia." So I said, "Okay." And I was being assigned to the Nang, Vietnam. So we went home and we bought we bought a house, actually just a couple hundred yards from your uh, Grandma Lucy's house. And it was, it was a nice place. Uh, lived there a year. One of the catastrophic things was uh, had a fire. This is where, uh, while I was still there, 
I had to coach, I took 30 days leave, you know, bought the house, and I took leave, and took leave so I could be there with the girls. And we had a, more than, we had 14 cats on one. 14 cats? Yeah, and, and that's what, what, never have a cat again. And one of them had knocked over a candle. We had a candle, which helped uh, uh, you know, keep, keep the, the smell down from the cats. And, but one of the cats knocked a candle over, and I started a fire. We did a couple of thousand dollars worth of damage, mainly smoke damage, but that, but insurance took care of that. No one was hurt? No, oh no, no one was hurt, luckily. And we're, we're watching TV and we see, we see flames in the show, but then we realized what we saw was a reflection of the flames. There was a couch oh. behind us. And, and I literally, this couch probably weighed 200 pounds, but I picked up almost like with one hand and got it out the, got it out the front door. But that got turned around okay. Then, then went off to Southeast Asia. Was uh, was originally signed to Saigon. In fact, my welcome in Southeast Asia was Vic Kong hit the base that. Oh, uh, I I pulled in to, to Saigon that night. The Vic Kong hit the base at Tansan. Oh. I got to see all the fireworks, including the guy right in front of me got dinged oh. with shrapnel. But. Uh, but but he was all right. It did. It just got nothing to our big hole of the thing. Um, this colonel was saying, you know, we're all there watching because it's shooting rockets and it's shooting mortars and all the other stuff. So we're watching all that, listening, trying to figure out where the next shell's going to land. And uh, uh, this colonel's yelling, "Come on into the latrine!" Because it hit it had concrete wall. So that's something. Here's about 30 of us jumping on the latrine. Then each of us trying to get to the bottom of the pile. You know, we on top of that pile of you. We're trying to get to the bottom. And we, figured, and we hit that because we could hear one. You can tell when a martyr is coming in, you hear it when it hits the very top. So you can actually figure very closely to where they were. So we thought the next one was going to hit real close. So we all, we knocked the colonel on his rear end. And, and we got into this concrete side of the little train. And a couple of pieces of into the little train on the side, but it didn't affect that. Uh, they damaged about 30 airplanes when they hit it that night, and uh, well-planned attack. So, but anyway, I'm there, and I'm doing things I, I detest. And I'm doing circuit, uh, uh, circuit, uh, uh, communication circuit design. That's where you got to figure the DB loss from point to point and things like you make, so you make pads and amplifiers to, to fit each circuit. This is the most boring job in the world. Pure electrical engineering, which I didn't mind, but it, to me it was totally boring. Then a job opened up in Thailand, but still under the same command, and they said, "Well, we want you to go over there and take this over because it, you know, it, it needs some action to get going on." So I said, "Send me." And I go over to uh, Karat, Thailand, which is up country, about 120, 130 miles north of uh, Bangkok. So I'm up there uh, you know, working away in the plans, and then the big boss in Bangkok, they call it Communist Bank, the Command of U.S. Uh, military Command uh, in Thailand, wanted me to come down to Bangkok, but wanted me to go for a, a three-year tour. I said, I, so I checked with the answer, no way did she want to go back, having just come to the Philippines, she didn't want to go back into, into Asia, or Southeast Asia especially. So I told the colonel, uh, or the general down there, I'm sorry, you know, I did, I'm not going to sign up for three years. I came over on a one-year tour. I said, okay, take the one-year tour, and uh, you go TDY from Karai. Well, that was good because with my temporary duty funding, I got to uh, rent a, a real nice apartment. In fact, uh, Tom Shenba Colonel became a real good friend, was in the same office, Japanese-American civilian. So we rented this big apartment, I think it was two or three bedrooms, a couple of baths and things like that, right in downtown Bangkok. Well, I did that with the funds I was getting from temporary duty. And I'd go back up to Karat once a week or something like that on the bus, just so you can say I wasn't there. <laughs> but then I did all the planning. You know, one thing, we were in school, in the advanced school, and the la our last exercise was, you come into a new country, you got to totally plan all the communication. And we all laughed. Ah, 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 who's going to do that? There's no new countries or anything else. And Bob, we went through all the process of the tournament. Well, sure enough, they set up all the, they told me, okay, set a plan, doing all the communications from Thailand. Of course, it's military, but 
but that's where I was. And I had that was good training. I got a case of it because I was able to sit down, knock out about a, a 300-page report and total wow. plan and everything else. And all the generals go ga ga because they, they, you know, they, they thought I'd spend months getting it done. I did it actually within a month. Wow. And while well, I had some pros working with me too and for me, so. And then, so that, that came up. The, the tour itself went real, real well. Um, uh, one thing, back to the car a little bit yet, we had a little pet cobra. Whoa. And, and he was about three feet long, he feisty as all get out. How'd you get but, him? Well, he was on it. We were in this trailer. And this is not where, not in the hooch I lived in, but the trailer where all the communication equipment was, the electronics. He was in this, he was in this, he was underneath the trailer. He was watching the police. Okay, he, he was underneath the trailer, and they would tease me, he'd come out and he'd make the hood, you know, and they would do everything else. And, uh, uh, so, uh, so then, anyway, that was the thing, we, we played with him, and that was another thing, I worked when I was in karate, I worked for this army colonel. And it was also ties in with cobras. This army colonel was saying, uh, you know, why is it that, you know, when you're walking down the road, the roads with dirt, dirt roads, and normally walking in a ditch in the traffic, he said, why, all my men salute me when I go by in a Jeep because they had coal on I said, Colonel, I'm, I'm more interested in looking out for cobras in these damn ditches. I'm looking to see who's going by in some stupid Jeep. Oh, he went to like and, uh, and I said, Colonel, I said, if I see you, I'll salute you. But if I don't see you, I don't know why I'm saluting that damn cheap. Okay. He was mature. He was gonna write my effective report. But the colonel down in Bangkok who was his boss, was the Air Force Colonel. And he told him, you're not writing anything bad about Richard because he's doing all these good things down here. He did this the countrywide plan, he's done all the other stuff, he does whatever we want fast and we want it done and everything else, you know, you can give an outstanding report. <laughs> so the colonel the army colonel, you know, bit his gums and bit his lips. Okay. So he gave me a good report and the co-signer on it was the Air Force Colonel did that a glowing report. And these all things help in the, in the, in the long term of whether you get promoted or not. You know. and that's part of the hustling bit. It, it was real good and I did get to go home once. Uh, I went back with this Colonel to, uh, to, 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 to Honolulu where we had a joint planning conference, Vietnam and Thailand, and a few others on how they split up this pot of money that the Department of Defense had given. Well, the colonel was sitting up front, and I'd given him all the information he needed to see if we could get, get a good share of it. And sure enough, with my information, the colonel knew, which also he showed me, I, I'd say, Colonel Vietnam's lying, and not telling you, I'm sitting behind him, sitting behind him saying that, that, that telling the story, he said, don't worry about it, Richard, just watch it. So he, well, he let Vietnam go on and on, and finally, he was making mental notes and things. He said, hey, we have to stop him. He said, he said well, everything they're saying is it, 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 it not, it not accurate, it shows they're not managing their, the money they have now correctly. They're making poor decisions, and everything I told him, he just line by line by line, he repeated. We walked out. Vietnam got no extra money. We got like $21 million or something like that, you know, more than what we had asked for. And uh, the colonel said, that's, that's what you do. You wait until you wait until there's an obvious error to everyone. Then you come in. And then well, everything you say sounds like, well, you know what the hell you're talking about. But if you say something when it's questionable, whether it's everyone recognizes it, then they'll always doubt what you bring up. So he gave me a good point on how you argue, your case, uh, how you present your case. So, so then after, so then I, I spent a, a year in Thailand. And how old are you now? And now, so I came back in uh, late 67, so I would have been 34. 34. Yeah, 34. And came back, come back home. Uh, then went, and then from there I was being assigned, I thought I was being assigned to the Pentagon. And so I go up to Washington, I stay with Mike and Marianne Jones, my good friends. They had actually been in school with us the first time in Kiesel. Went to the Philippines with us the whole time, and I was Mike's boss all the way through. And uh, we, and then I stayed with Mike and Marianne. Right over uh, New Year's, 
that week, uh, so right, right over New Year's, and then from there I was look, actually looking for a house, and then report into the Pentagon, they said, I'm saying, well, what have you, you been doing? I said, I'm the same way friend. I said, wait, I've been looking for a house, and I think I spotted one. He said, oh, don't, don't buy. I said, why? What's wrong with buying? This isn't your end assignment. You look at your orders. You report into the Pentagon for further assignment. Your assignment is, I can say it now, with the deep underground of Fort Ritchie, or near Fort Ritchie, near Site R. Well, it is Site R, but it's, it's near uh, Camp David. Uh, Wait, you can't say it because it's deep secret? Well, oh, okay. yeah, that's all right now. All right. It's all right. It's, 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 it's We're going to be getting on 70 West. Okay, good. The, um, you want me to turn, turn off just for a yeah, second? Yeah, sure. Get around this. Okay, we're back. Okay, well now, and, and, and what we do, we stop just for a second, and we're now on 70 West. I had not towards Denver, we'll be on this for 440 miles before we get to the Denver area on 70 West. Okay, we we're talking, um, now I'm being assigned to Fort Ritchie out of the Pentagon. And they said, I said, are you sure? And they said, yeah. I said, and they said they would, I said, and they told me what I was, I, said, I don't think I'll like that, you know, uh, being on the ground. And they said, oh, don't worry, we'll take you up in a helicopter and show you around. And <laughs> not to be worried about. So I kept waiting for the helicopter right? In the meantime, uh, they're, they're teaching me everything about how uh, a command post operates, you know, worldwide communication, instantaneous worldwide communication, both with with the command post around the world, with airplanes flying, and everything else. And I kept waiting for this, and I'm learning. And and I met this great actor who was who was also a two, he was also a general in the Air Force, but in the Reserve. And that was. God, I can see him right in front of me, but I can't think of his name right now. Will later, a really, really prince of a guy. He was a, been a bomber pilot in World War II and still flew all the bombers, including the B-52, which is flying today. Oh God, what's his name? I met him because he came to visit the command post. Then they said, "Well," I said, "Where's my helicopter?" They said, "Well, we're in Tabor. We really can't can't square the helicopter." But they gave me a map. They said, "Here's how you get to Fort Ritchie." And so just drive, but take all your stuff, because that's your new home. Wow. Oh, wow. So I go up to Fort Ritchie, get on, well, before I go to Fort Ritchie, right on New Year's Day or the day after that, at Mike and Mary Ann's show down in the Washington area, I was smoking. Mike liked to make uh, uh, Manhattans. We had, we had a couple of three or maybe even four Manhattans. I'm sitting there smoking. Long ash in the cigarette, wearing a white shirt. Probably the last time I wore a white shirt. And smoking and drinking a Manhattan all at the same time. And talking and joking and laughing. And all of a sudden, the cigarette ash drops right across my white shirt. And I was so embarrassed, I took the pack of my pack of cigarettes out. Now, I've been smoking for around 12 years, maybe even 15 years. I, but I took the pack of cigarettes out of my pocket, smushed them up, crushed them up. Through my crash and I said never again. I never have never touched a cigarette since then. Wow. But I did go through some periods, you know, you go to cocktail parties and things like that. You see everybody else smoking and you, and you go to grab and there's nothing there to grab. But then, you know, got used to it. But that's that's Good. but that's how I quit smoking cigarettes, which was the, the big thing. And right there we need to stop and switch the disc. Okay, got it. We were talking about uh, I quit smoking uh, cigarettes. And uh, in the meantime, I, I had signed up for a house. When I got to Fort Ritchie, I signed, signed for quarters. We're actually very fortunate we were able to get quarters. Uh, I, think, I think it took until that summer. But in the meantime, Ann and the girls are back at the house that we had bought near Grandma Lucy's. So I'm sitting up there, and I lived in the barracks for several months, and, and a lot of snowstorms and, and everything else. And, and Fort Ritchie, it was unbelievably beautiful. I mean, it was like a, it literally was a little fort, and uh, and it's one that 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 you and I had visited when, when we went to visit Williamsburg that mm, time, right? Yeah. And what an unbelievable place, it, 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 totally. Uh, and so we had a very enjoyable four and a half years there. And just everything. There was a whole bunch of little things, and, and the girls belonged to all of the Girl Scouts and Cub Scouts and everything else as they were growing up. We got to, we visited everything, 
almost constantly. Yeah. I went up and uh, and it's where I had gone down. The Air Force was nice enough to permit me to go to the University of Tampa to finish up my uh, my degree. In and this this was a degree in, in economics, and uh, but it was a bachelor's, and uh, and that it was just very fortunate because I got back from getting the degree. Now I was down there by myself, except I rented an apartment and I was staying on a base. Finished school, almost finished school, but had the girls come down when they were out of school. The girls and Anne came down to an apartment we had in Tampa, right near the water. And uh, so we got to see through all the stuff around Tampa and until I graduated and then we been, went back up to Fort Ritchie. And then the boss I had, uh, I had a buddy who said, you know, the, the University of Shippensburg, which is, um, well, Shippensburg State then, is probably the, one of the oldest teaching universities in the, state of, in the state of Pennsylvania system, which is a really good system. It then became the University of Shippensburg. Uh, real nice, real old school, but I got into this program, I got into that communications program. Now this is a communication program, it was, they call it a master's plus program, and I, and I just got in the bachelor's. So they hemmed and hawed a little bit, but they, they, they took me and I talked to the president, and uh, I went through and then I saw that, hey, this was similar to the work that I was doing anyway at the time, and in fact, uh, now you got a picture. It's, it's made for te for senior teachers. This, this master's program, and they expected the teachers to take up to five years to do it, and they would give them an extension beyond five years if they needed to get this master's plus degree. Well, I had ten months. And I knew I had to leave there. I I, I had put in for an extension to finish up the program. They said they could, but the school was getting a little bit antsy because I'm I'm rushing through. The, I'm getting a straight A. But I'm rushing through much faster than I thought I should. Uh, they, 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 they were, the teachers, the professors would give me some almost impossible assignments, like things that they wouldn't do. They, so they wanted me to, they said, well, can you talk to the head of the National Education Association in Washington? We want you to talk to the Education Association, the president of that in Washington, thinking, who am I to go down to Washington and talk to the head of NEA? I said, okay, okay. So I went and I had my little recorder. I went and, and called down and said, hey, I'm coming down and talking to you. You are? Who are you? I said, who I am, but I'm coming down. And this is for Shippensburg. Okay, so I went down and had a big interview, got all the questions they answered. <laughs> they come back and they oh. Then they had me talk to the head of uh, the Department of Education for Pennsylvania. He said, well, I'm not going to do that. But I called him up and said, I'm coming to see you. <laughs> and he said, okay. Probably the first time anyone said that, been that direct, I'm coming to see you. So I went in, got all the questions answered, you know, and had a nice interview and stuff like that. Brought the tape back to school. I'm still getting A's, but they still didn't know, the professors collectively didn't know that I was going to graduate 10 months on this program. They set up for five years. Seriously? Oh, yeah. So, so what they did, almost like they did down in Tampa, uh, this one professor, but what they did, they found this out. Well, what, what I did, I went to the president and said, you know, I talked to him. He, over time, he'd come a little friendly, I saw him a lot of times. So I go to see the president of the university. And I said, you know, I, you know, I hate to do this, but, uh, you know, uh, if I could, I'd stay longer, but I've only got 10 months. I've got to go back overseas. And they said, okay, go ahead, but don't tell the professor because they'll get very upset. So I didn't. Except they found out in the grapevine, so they changed my last two, uh, my last two credits. So I'm going to do six hours of credit, but they changed it from an A to a B, so I didn't get a straight A through my math. Oh. But that was the only two. That was the only two I got with the two Bs. And so I graduated from Shippensburg. Then <laughs> the Air Force says they're going to put me in C-135. That's a flying tank. I said, like, "You're out of your skull." And this, at this time, I'm past 35. I think, how old was I? Uh, this was a 1979. Yeah, this is in, no, 1972. I'm getting towards the summer. And actually, in late spring, before I graduated with a master's, but I'm getting close to the time. I got an extension, okay, for six months. And then the Air Force personnel decided they could put me in 135. I said, 
not run, you know, this is, I don't read regulations very much, but this time I did. And it said they want people, because you're going through another whole new training, they, they, want, they want you to be below 35. Well, um, this is 1968, I'm right at, uh, 60, no, 1972. So I'm almost, at this time, I'm almost 39, I'm starting talking to them. I said, hey man, I can't, I'm sorry I can't go to 135 because the book, good, the good book, regulation and so on, so it says I can't go. <gasps> oh, well where do you want to go? I said, well, I think in Europe, I said, well we got this, yeah, he said, we got this special air mission squadron. Uh, would you like that? Got back flying DC-6s. Well, I've been flying DC-6s in, in, out of Washington uh, uh, on, the, on their special mission crew there. I said, great, I'll take DC-6. What do special missions crew do? Well, special missions, they fly generals, admirals, they fly kind of codels, we call them congressional oh, okay. delegations, of representatives and senators and things like that. Secretary of the Air Force, we flew a couple of times. So anyway, I go in the squad. Ideal. It flew all over Europe. But anyway, so that was the next assignment. So we pack up, and this time we all go get to fly together. We go up to New Jersey, and we have a friend up in New Jersey who got the girls' tickets to see uh, some. Oh God, the girls don't remember the name. He's got an English guy. Got read a loud, booming, very, you know, very, very popular, uh, popular singer. No, we have forgotten his name. Jane, Jane. Jones, Jones, I'm Jones. Anyway, so they got to see this kind of thing. We got the concert while we're up in New Jersey waiting for our airplane. So we all fly into uh, into Frankfurt together, and then we 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 uh, we then take the train, or somebody picked us up, or something took us to Wiesbaden, which is only about 15 miles away. Go to Wiesbaden, and we rented a place up in Georgenborn, up in the mountains. And in fact, it was on the grounds of a castle that we, we rented as a part of the little apartment. Quite a little, it was nice. And so that's, that started our, our, our German tour. Now we, because uh, I got to extend each place, normally for a new assignment. We were there in Wiesbaden, and then they decided to, to move the Special Air Mission Squadron to, uh, to Ramstein. And uh, I like the Wiesbaden area. Wanted to stay there. However, they what they did is okay. We'll, we'll move you to Frankfurt to the, to the airport at, at the Rhein-Main or, or Frankfurt Airport, where we actually we moved and we lived on the on the airport in Frankfurt. So we moved out to Thomas Mountain, we moved down to the Frankfurt Airport, and we had an apartment on the base, which is part the back part of the Frankfurt Airport, for a couple of years. And that's where the girls were in high school. That's where we'd also got a note back uh, from the teacher saying that the girls were in real good in school. The only problem was they hung around with each other, and not and not with everybody else. And but that was the girls. I was I was, I was real proud of them. I was, but I always thought the girls did fantastic anyway. Uh, and they could they made me feel great all the time. One of the things that the girls did is being that they didn't like I would. <laughs> You know, me being typical military, everything had to be lined up. So I made up a, a schedule. Okay, <laughs> Kathy would do the dishes this night, Diane would do the dishes, and Sandy would do the dishes. So this was the way it was going to be. They said, Baloney Dad, they went out and babysat, and they got enough money, and they bought Ann a dishwasher. Oh. And, 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 and so that they wouldn't have to do dishes anymore. <laughs> so I mean, Smart. another thing, and another thing that actually helped me get promoted to full colonel. Uh, while I was on the base, we had, a, uh, we had a, a real good friend, he was a colonel, later became a general, later became a three-star general. Uh, which I, once again, I want to think of his name, I'll say it, the girls know him because and their daughter was the same age, went to school with him and everything else. But he once, we had a whole, he had a whole group of officers in with him, lieutenant colonels, which I am at the time. And he said, okay, I need, to, we, let's, what can we do to attract people, to show people what we're doing here? on the military side of the world's, one of the world's largest airports, civil airport. And it's something nice. So I said, well, maybe we can have a, uh, we'll have a, a show and tell, we'll have a, a, a what do you call it, where everybody gets to come and take a look. Thinking at that time, people thought, well, maybe 5,000 people would come. So, but he said, okay, Richard, that's it. He said, well, okay, that's a good idea. Anyone want to do it? No one raised their hand. I said, well, 
I'll do it. You know, I didn't have any idea what was involved in having a party for 5,000 people. Well, as we go along, he said, well, get permission from General Jones. Jim. There's a General Jones Jim, who's a four-star, who was command, commander-in-chief for, for European Air Force. So it's okay, but of course, it doesn't, the letter doesn't go to him. It goes to whoever handles it, who was a, uh, a lieutenant colonel like, like I was, but a senior lieutenant colonel. Or was he a colonel? Anyway, he comes back, not a no, but hell no, you're not about to have an air show or you are an Air Force show at this world's largest civil, the world, world's largest civil airport, I think it was the third largest in the world. You're not about to do that, disrupt traffic and everything else. I said, it's like General Neutron, I said, it was Colonel Neutron at the time. I said, Colonel, you know, these idiots are saying that we know in the world they permit us to have it. Oh. He said, General Jones is coming up here in a week to, to visit the base and everything. And I'm going to have step a little before you talk to him. So, tell him about your plans for your party <laughs> that you were going to have. And so I didn't say, so General Jones said, sure, I hear now all of a sudden I'm talking to Lieutenant I'm talking to the four-star general. And the general goes, let me tell you about this idea I have. You know, we can have this party and we'll show all the Air Force airplanes that we have and we'll make it really good public relations for the Air Force. He looks at what? I said, you know, it's the world's third largest airport. You have it here? I said, yeah, we'll do it. Well, we'll take care of it. Of course, at this time I'm getting an idea we're not going to have. I said, General, we may have, not 5,000 people, we may have as many as 250,000 people. So he laughs. Well, he said, I'm thinking it is something like that. But if you can plan it, go ahead. Tell, I want you to write this, you know, write a little note to this colonel, send him a message, tell him I said you're going to have this, this party, you know, this thing. So it was a pleasure because the person he told me to send this note to, that, that he already gave permission for me to have it, it's the same person who just turned me down. <laughs> so he said, Touche! So I wrote this little nice message that General Jones said that we will have them. Not that we could. He said we will have this this meeting. Yeah. And and then one night at one of them called me. I, in fact, it was 1976. I said, "Well, I dreamed this. Use an American word of together. In other words, we're bringing both cultures together. Together. Then I looked up the German word together, zusammen. So that was the name of name of our big party. Together, zusammen 76. And everybody helped out on it. We had and we did have. 250,000. Wow. My party was for 250,000 people. And it lasted for two days. And, and the civil people were not upset at us because we told them exactly what we're doing. And and but and they had to get all the police out. They had everything on a couple of vignettes on it. But they had all the police out because people were crossing, walking across the runway to, 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 come, to, come, to come be with it. Oh God, to come see the party. And I would have had, I got the squad and, and all and how the sergeants started communicating. The sergeants imported fresh corn from Iowa. They imported all these things from all of the U.S. states because their buddies who were at Air Force bases, they loaded airplanes come to the nook and cranny. It was all loaded to go to Rhine Mine, to the Frankfurt Mine. So these guys set up, they cook corn. Of course, the Germans looked at corn as something you feed cows, not something you eat, and that's the way it's grown. You don't have the full, the full ears like we have. And, they, and so, man, they were selling. They were selling like for a couple of marks a bit, a couple of bucks a piece. You know, they were selling this ears of corn. They made the squatters made money like mad. And and uh, now another thing, this is right at the time of the Mine Hump Gang, Red Brigade, and all these other uh, terrorist groups. And the colonel says, man, the colonel uh, said, my boss said, you better do something to make sure that uh, we're okay. So. I said, let's get the German police, the Polish side, and a special, as a special territorial police, which I've got a, a security unit. So, well, just before this, I had briefed the local mayor. There are 30 local mayors. And so Colonel Newton, who, who, who spoke German exceptionally fluently, got a, a, a translator for me. And so I briefed the 30 mayors on what the party was going to be, and expected traffic problems off the Autobahn, and I told him, and I think it was near 250,000 people. I don't know how I dug up the figure, but it later became totally accurate. 
And they said, great. So I spoke all the way through in English. Then I practiced about three minutes in German to close it off. This, and this, this translator was so simultaneous, I mean, it was simultaneous. As I'm talking, he's speaking German. I switched to German, and he started speaking English. And oh. Of course, it's, it broke up the 30 merit. Totally, including Colonel Noodle over there. It broke him up. And now he's so used to trans, you know, trans, he's translating my German back into English for the German merit. Yeah, so that was that was delightful. Well, the part the party turned out literally turned out fantastic. But what did I know about the terrorists? I got them the the German intel on the police side to talk. They said, okay, through they the, their friend, they they said they'll put no one. They'll have over 100 people on the ground that you won't recognize because they're not wearing uniform. They have over 100 people on the ground, and they're in they're well integrated in the crowd. You'll have your own people in a great new crowd. No problem. Like we guarantee no problem. They had put word out. In fact, we found out later, yes, members of various gangs had come. But they came just as, as tourists to see the airplanes and things like that, not to blow them up. About three weeks later, Wiesbaden Air Base tried the same thing. And <laughs> there's one thing back group that got on board, and they unfurled a big banner of Americans go home and all the other stuff. But here I am with 250,000 people and they didn't do anything except come look at the airplane. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was neat. And once again, showing that when you, you know, you're straight with people, that for the most part, they're, they're going to be straight with you. Uh, but we did now. Here's how, how Kathy, your mom, came in on this and, and, your, and your aunts. Kathy was one. Was, it was like, save the children in Biafra. And so your mom, you know, once again, she's the typical party. She volunteered. She was saying that she wanted to I mean, mean, go out and raise money. So she got me to agree to give her 900 bucks for the Save the Biafra Fund that she was heading in the high school. If she'd get the kids to help clean up. You know, 250,000 people was one hell of a cleanup job. Got the squad in, but here's Kathy and her high school gang, including her sister, out there picking up all the trash for, for, for a day, but they picked they did a super job, well worth the 900 bucks uh, that she gave to charity. And uh, but that was your mom. She was always she was a little volunteer for these things, as, as well as, as your aunts too. You know, they were they were always into something. And you know, bless their heart. So this is Ryan Wine, and, and we I said we thoroughly enjoyed. It. Now it's time. What I did, I made myself. I knew that, that Colonel Nudelman would be making general. In fact, he moved down to ramps. He was going down to ramps to, to get a bigger job. Now, I didn't want to work for somebody else. And I made myself up a little uh, uh, brochure. I'll tell it had all my good things in it, you know, and all the good things people had said about me and my effective reports were. You know, I was really lucky they were, they were glowing. But I had a brochure, and if somebody said something, I'd show my brochure. <laughs> so, the people down, down at Ramstein, who were in, in plant, one thing, I mean, here's another thing. The Air Force person on this time, they decided they're going to get me. And now they said, I have to go back into communication because I, I trained, besides flying, I had trained uh, within, within uh, communication electronics. Well, I didn't really want to go there because it was sort of dead end for me at the time. Uh, they were later to try that again. But anyway, headquarters Air Force, you were heard about me looking for a job. He said, okay, uh, it's your first time into big plant, airplane plants and things like that, but, but we want you to come down to Rams. I think, great. So the next thing I know, we moved down to Rams and I take over this job and plants. And that that solidified me when, uh, on a promotion list that came out, uh, which is a funny on that, a year and a half or so after I'm down there, I got promoted to, uh, to the Rams. Now, oh, we moved down this time we moved to the village of Bond, and we lived on, we had a big farm patch behind us where we grew all kind of stuff, and the house lived at the very top of this hill, which is really neat because we got to see everything except, talk about, you had to know how to drive in snow and ice because snow and ice was, I mean, that was, that was the thing we lived with in this village, which is way high up in the hills near the base. Uh, Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable house, big, and that's where your girls got into all kind of shenanigans that that I didn't know about, <laughs> including the one that where I thought I smelled marijuana. I, I still to this day don't know what marijuana smells like, but I thought I, I smelled marijuana, and I, I told.
told the girls that, uh, okay, girls, you know, I, I'm tired of this marijuana and stuff. They said, oh, dad, dad, we told the guy, don't light up a, a joint, whatever you call it, in, in their house because dad doesn't like it, really doesn't like it. They would stop having a party. And, then, and they said, well, we told him not to, and he did it, but we really said, they apologized. And they said, when did you smell it? I said, this morning. And he said, the party was six weeks ago, dad. <laughs> I said, Lord, no, but I didn't smell it. Uh, so, that cracked him up. This is where we used to have, Kathy would call, and her sister would call, Diana said, we'd call for family conference. Which, I wasn't that pleased with, because I knew it was one thing. So, if we'd sit there, we'd sit down at the, at the dining room table. For the next 30 minutes, the girls had a list of all my sins and all my foibles. And they listed them one after the other and said, Dad, I've got to, they told me I had to reform them. And they, they didn't like what I was doing. I, uh, they didn't like everything. So that's, that's what I found in Congress. Went. And then they, they would decide what we'd do next and what kind of vacations we'd go on. Uh, you know, other things like the fact that this was still back in Wiesbaden, but uh, their their cousin had come over, from, uh, 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 Patsy's daughter had come over and spent, the, spent like six or eight weeks with us when we, when we went down to Italy together. And me, we're driving through Switzerland on the way down to Italy. And uh, I thought the girls weren't paying enough attention to these beautiful, the beautiful Swiss Alps that we're going through. They're all reading books. I stopped the car and I said, girls, learn something. Look out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Put down the books. <laughs> so that lasted about 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, yes, okay. They looked out the window. Okay, Dad, what are we supposed to be looking at? You know, and it's like things like, go back, read your books. So we go down to this little, uh, on the uh, town Riviera, Lazio, and we had a delightful apartment, and we had a delightful week down in Lazio. And, uh, so, and we go back to Wiesbaden, that was at Wiesbaden. Then we took several trips, uh, including a trip to England together, which was a little, uh, a little bit hilarious. We go to England, where we'd rent boats on the Thames, and that was always fantastic. Uh, just, we, we'd drive it ourselves, and we'd spend a full week. It's like taking your hotel with you. And we did one, and that one time we're at this real famous little town on the Thames. And I'm taking, I take off from it, I look back, and Kathy and Diane have their legs hanging, and I'm, I'm going down the river, and they have their legs hanging over the pier. I left them, I left them on the pier, and they're just laughing and having fun. I almost panicked, I, and this time we got a 48 foot boat, and I swung that boat around, I almost clobbered about a half dozen other uh, yachts at the same time, you know. But we did this several times. We got them down, we got them down the Thames, going to various parts of the Thames. That's thoroughly delightful. That was one of our vacations. Uh, there was one time when Sandy and her friend, uh, who was her, her friend uh, Jack and Jackie's daughter, uh, they can, we flew over on Aravac, and the Aravac plane was plush. And being a full, being a full colonel at this time, uh, we got you know we got choice seats and everything else. And, but for some reason, we said we'd let, we'd let Sandy and her friend uh, come over by train. So I mean, we were there like a day before they got there, they come on a train. So we all got out of train station at the right, there's about six or eight of them in, in London. We go down to the right train station, we watch a train come in, I think from Dover or wherever. And, and we got, they, they had to take a train and to take a boat and to take a train. So I'll wait for that train and they don't get off of it. Now, now we got two, I don't know, 12 or 13 year old girls somewhere in Europe. And I totally freaked out. Went and talked to the, the train master there in, in London. He said, well, the train was so full that we had to put on a second train. It'll be in about 15 minutes. So sure enough, the girls were on the second train. That's one of the things. A panic a day, you know, keeps the heart flowing. Okay. Just like an apple? Yeah, like an apple a day, yeah. I don't know if I told it before, but this act this also actually happened. Now this is the first time we've been in a boat in town. It was just Barbara and you know, this was just Ann and myself on the boat. We come to the very first lock and it's cold. Because we always to ensure we got a boat, we always run it either in the in the spring or in the fall. And it would sometimes be uh, most of the time it's delightful, sometimes it would be damn cold, especially on the water. So I was wearing an overcoat, and I had my passport in my pocket. 
I always carry the pimp in the pocket, which I, I should learn. They go in, and I tie, we tie up the nose, and we figure, well, we get to the first lock, and the lock match, you know, and raise the board, and then raise the water level. Go to get off the boat, go we'll, we'll in and got no, she tied up the nose. Well, being fresh in the, the, the big boat, I pulled the power back, but it's still going a few revolutions. Well, now the nose is tied up, so the boat with the with the with the prop turn, the boat's falling out. I'm looking at Ann, who's standing on the dock, you know, so she's not moving. I, I walked out and walked straight off the boat. I mean, straight right down into the water, overcoat and everything else. I um, <laughs> I can be in the in the in the, in the, in the yeah, we go to the bottom of and home just about the bottom of the lock. I come back up and um, and Ann says, You watch. So then I put my arm up like that, keep the watch out, then I went straight back down again. This time, the, con the dock mass, uh, or the, uh, the lock mass, is laughing real hard, but he's got it. But I'm not the first one ever to do this. So he's got this big hook. He said, Okay, sir, grab the hook. So I grabbed the hook and he pulled me over to the stairs. I was able to come up under the stairs. And um, he said, do you have any sherry? Well, before we took off, we had bought four or five bottles of sherry, you know, because, you know, we'd be on the boat for a week, and this we did a sip of little sherry, because it's nice and cold and thing. He said, you and I will split a bottle. And he said, go over and take out, and, and the boats do have hot showers on the board, and they were just delightful, because once the prop, once the motor's on, the motor heats the water, and you have, you have a hot shower. Well, they go to the, tie up on the outside, you and I can open up Changed clothes. I went over, you know, pulled the passport out and everything. We changed, we um, changed clothes, and sure enough, he came on board. He and I had a, we did a damage that bottle of shit. <laughs> then I went on, and of course I watched it. And now I know how you tie up a boat when you come into the, right. the lock. Well, the end of this was a week or ten days later. We were at Dover, Delaware, and, and we go through, uh, we go through. Uh, Immigration, I guess if you'd call it, and and the guy, typical English, look at that. You got to figure my passport now is smudgy, all the ink in it is smudge because it's been underwater. And it's but it's dry. But I hand it to him, and he takes one, he flips through the pages, and he sees all the writing. He says, he says, oh, he says, fell into the Thames. No, I fell into the Thames, did you? <laughs> yeah, you know, and just cracked this up completely because we hadn't said a word about the Tim's or anything else. And he smiled and laughed, and we did too. Oh. I don't know how you figured out. He said, "Well, you're not the only one that ever comes through here like that." Well, and uh, so apparently, other people have fell right. in, fallen into Tim's off. And that we're was, gonna have to stop there because there's only two minutes left. Oh wow! I know you're quite a talker. Oh okay. Yeah, I gotta talk faster. Then we'll come back. But yeah, we'll come back. We'll come back after lunch or something. Got it.